good morning. Um, so that was pretty cool. I really enjoyed that that last presentation with uh, Christoph Parr, which is funny because my actual very first introduction to hardware security was uh, when I was an undergraduate and chess was running on campus. And uh, I was like, what are all these people doing in my building? Um, and turns out they were doing hardware security stuff, which was kind of neat. Um, unfortunately, it took me a few years to come back around and get back into hardware security. Um, so what I've got for you today is hardware root of mistrust. But first, who am I? Um, I've been at Hardware.io the past few years uh, doing training. Uh, my background is electrical engineering. Um, I've done silicon debug, uh, but then switched into uh, product security. So I was doing uh, desktop and server CPU pen testing, pre and post silicon. Um, I've also done a lot of security training. I started that when I was working at Intel, uh, teaching functional validators how to identify what might be a security vulnerability, um, because they really didn't have a concept of what to look for when it came to security. Um, right now, I have a few classes that I teach, uh, physical attacks on embedded systems, x86 systems, as well as an advanced class on uh, physical attacks and hardware pen testing. Um, I also own a pair of shoes with LEDs in them, just in case that came up. Um, my co-researcher, uh, who is not here to present with me, uh, is Root Killer, aka Mike Leibowitz. Um, he uh, has a, a long background in embedded systems um, and has done all sorts of things with bootloaders and firmware images and interesting things like that. And without his help, uh, half of these projects probably would never gotten anywhere because he's a lot better at getting things done than I am. Um, oh my goodness, I forgot my Bible. I was going to read an excerpt from the, uh, the uh, book of POC or GTFO, but we'll have to do without it this time. Um, so wouldn't it be really cool if we had this little magical hardware device, right? It would encrypt things for us and decrypt them. We could authenticate things for us. We could authenticate ourselves to others, right? Basically, there's one little device that would solve all our personal insecurities. Um, it'd be really cool, even cooler if it fit in the palm of our hand. It was really easy to use, like easier than not using. And it only cost a few bucks. This would be pretty awesome, right? Who would use this device? Some of you. Okay. Who already uses this device? Um, wouldn't it be lame if this turned into a sales pitch for a hardware security device? I think it would be. Um, so here are a couple examples of hardware security devices. We have an RSA Secure ID token, right? It spits out a six-digit number every minute, and that six-digit pin that we put in with our password helps us verify that not only do we know our password, we also have um, a, a, a token, a physical thing, something we know as well as something we have. Also, a YubiKey. We plug this into a USB port, and we touch the button on the top, and that spits out a one-time password of some sort. Um, there's some cryptography that goes on in there, and I'm not really good at cryptography. I just know that they work. Um, and lastly, over here, we have a trusted platform module. This is on a laptop, com uh, sorry, desktop computer where there's a header on there, and you plug in your trusted platform module, and this is great because it'll hold on to your keys for your full disk encryption, so you can um, you know, not have to worry about the fact that your full disk encryption keys are sitting on the disk that you're encrypting with. Um, so the problem is we have all these things, but they're actually not magic. Uh, some people think, oh, it's hardware security, it's immutable, it's, pa it's perfect, it's, it's pristine, we don't have to worry about it. Um, and we do put a little effort into uh, hardware threat modeling. So we have these classic you know, hardware threat modeling test cases. We say, okay, well, we have the evil maid attack. You, know, you leave your laptop in your room, and you go out and you know, attend the conference, and you come back, and your room is clean, and something's on your laptop. Whether it was put there once and is malicious, or whether it's put there and retrieved the next day, who knows? We also have a whole bunch of supply chain attacks. Um, whether this is a supply chain attack on the silicon manufacturing, or the board assembly, or interdiction uh, between uh, uh, shipping, uh, the, the manufacturer shipping a device and the consumer receiving it. Um, we basically sneak in there and modify the hardware in some way uh, and t turn, it, turn the hardware bad. Um, and lastly, we've got the end user, right? If you think of uh, anything that involves uh, jailbreaking phones um, or modding uh, game consoles, this is the scenario where the end user, the owner of the hardware, is actually the one who's doing the hardware attack against their own device. Uh, the attacker is the owner in this case. How do we get in to do these things? Um, we have external uh, ports on the device. We have internal pins. When we open the device, we can easily access. Um, we have scenarios where we could use counterfeit chips. And lastly, if we're really fancy, we can use intrusive techniques. We can start decapping and modifying chips that are uh, live and in use. So here's the thing. We've got all this stuff going on, and we've got these hardware security modules, and we want to figure out a way to, to mess with these modules. So you know, the old adage is don't attack the, the standard, attack the implementation. 
right? However, in this case, we're referring to the, not referring to the hardware implementation, how the device is glued together and, and everything like that. We're referring to the common use cases and the common scenarios that these things go and are used in. So we're you know, aware that there might be issues with how this device is built, but we want to see how people are using them and how the way people are using them makes them prone to uh, a few issues. So we've got five case studies. Um, the first is the RSA Secure ID token. Who's ever used one of these before? Right? Who's ever been at a conference and like found them lying on the floor and wondered where they came from? <laughs> Who's ever dropped a bunch of them on the floor of a conference to see what happens? <laughs> um, so well, let's take a step back, though. Like these, these devices, you know, you get them programmed with your PIN. You, your IT department knows what that PIN is, or the, 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 the key that generates that PIN, so you can verify you have the token. Um, but really, let's, let's take a step back. What's the real easiest way in? Like, how did this company get breached before? Um, an email that says, I forward this file to your review. Please open it and review it, right? So it comes down to an extremely sophisticated cyber attack, AKA phishing, that really is the way an attacker is going to get in. So everything we're talking about, this is kind of a special case kind of scenario. This is when the typical attacks don't work. That's the only reason you ever go down to the level of a hardware attack. So we look at what RSA says about these devices. They're tamper resistant. They can extend, uh, withstand extreme physical conditions. They can get submerged in water and still work. This all sounds pretty cool. Um, but really, like, there's no mention of an attacker. Um, so, you know, when they said they, they can withstand water, they didn't say anything about acetone or poor judgment, right? So dunk one of these in acetone for a little while, it comes apart into all the little pieces, you can see what's on there, it's pretty easy. Um, of course, it turn out, turns out it's just as easy, as easy to do it with a Dremel, but, you know, acetone's always a fun, fun thing to play with. A whole lot friendlier than nitric acid. Um, so let's take some common assumptions about how these things work. So we're using these because you worry that the, con the, the computer might be owned or your password might be leaked, but the token is separate, so you need both of these things. The master key inside the chip is what everybody thinks the attacker's after. The attacker wants that master key so they can generate their own pins to log in whenever they want. And when designing this, the designers decided we want to make sure that getting that key is going to either be destructive, you're going to, have to destroy the device, and the person's going to notice it's missing or broken or something like that, or it's going to be very time consuming, so by the time you get the key out, the owner of the, of the token has realized it's missing or gone or taken. So let's take a different approach to this. When we have a, a device like this, we eventually have to spit out something in plain text, right? What do we get? We get a little LCD display with, a, with six digits on it. That sounds pretty interesting. What if we had a way to get at that without worrying about all the crypto underneath? Um, it needs that output to be functional. So can we sniff and relay that? So let's take a look at what's inside. Um, so my first attempt at taking one of these apart, I dremeled the bottom, bottom off and started wiring pins uh, to, to, to leads. And I realized very quickly that I had triggered some sort of tamper detection mechanism. So this one no longer worked. Luckily, I bought a box of 100 of them for like 20 bucks on eBay, which I later dropped on the floor at DEF CON. Um, dropped is, implies accidental. It was very intentional. So I try again. I'm more careful this time. I use a finer pitch of wire. I'm able to solder all these leads on without triggering any tamper detection on this device. Sounds pretty cool. Let's look at what we're talking about, talking about. Down here I have my logic analyzer, which I hook up to some of the pins on the back, and I can tell this little dot toggles every second. And I look at all my signals and I see that toggle changes every second from a very fast pulse to a very short pulse. Okay. Look at it nice and close. This is when it is on, and this is when it is off. Okay. That's something we can observe and detect and tell the difference. I believe this was uh, 20 hertz it was running at, or no. Yeah, 20 hertz. It was a, a pretty slow speed, I was surprised. Um, if we look more, we see these bars on the side here and these decrement. So we start out with uh, five bars, and then we have four bars, three bars, two bars, one bar, and then no bars, and then we get our new pin uh, a moment later. And if we look at our logic analyzer at 12 seconds, at 22 seconds, and at 32 seconds, we see these bars turning off, right? Okay we can basically use a logic analyzer to peek and see exactly what's being displayed on this. How can we do this um, automatically? So the pseudocode we use is basically we sample a pin at 128 hertz, right? And if we get a 010, or sorry, 101 or a 010, that means the pin is on. That's where we got this scenario right here, right? 010, 010. If we get anything else, then we are in the other scenario. We either get a 000, 111, or 001, 110, any other combination. It's not good. 
there's some room for, for error. There could be some like jitter and timing and quantization issues we run into, but we don't care. Most of the time, it's going to work. That's good enough for us. Bars build. Uh, so now we've got this data. We can tell which LED segments are on and off, LCD. Uh, LCD. So we need to get this data off somehow. So I've been playing with these little devices, the, the Regato BMD300. It's a tiny little Bluetooth module. So it's a Nordic Semiconductor uh, Bluetooth chip with a Cortex-M4 processor. I think it runs at 72 megahertz. It's pretty capable. It's got lots of GPIO and plenty of computing horsepower to read all these pins. It's also like incredibly uh, power conservative, so it, it takes uh, tiny, tiny, tiny fractions of, of amps, uh, milliamps to, to power and do all this stuff and then broadcast it over Bluetooth. Who's ever modified a game console before? Right? These are pretty neat. I, I really like referring to these things because what game console mod chips are, they're essentially like consumer oriented hardware implants, right? So they try and make these things as easy as possible so they can sell them for, you know, 10 to 50 bucks. So anybody, even with no soldering skill, can go and line it up and realize that all the soldering points line up perfectly and cover up all the things they don't want to solder to. So it's really easy. You can just go in there, and anybody with no skill can go and solder uh, an implant into their, their GameCube to go and modify the drive. So it lets them play their backup copies of their games. So let me, let me think what I can do. So I uh, designed my little implant, right? We've got the pad where that little BMD module sits. It's got a whole bunch of uh, uh, pads on the bottom that line up to these pads on the top. Um, and then the pins around the edge are lined up to meet up with the pins that go out to the LCD. You might notice here there's this debug port, and like, yeah, maybe that's the right way to go in, but like, forget that for now. We're, we're working for like a, a fun way of doing this. So, and it would also take a lot of work to, to reverse engineer that debug port, um, because you'd actually have to have a bit more hardware, and all I had was a bag of uh, RSA tokens that I got for 20 bucks on eBay. Um, so I believe I have posted this to GitHub. If not, I should. Git.io slash token. Token, T-O-K-I-N. You get it? Ha <laughs> ha. Um, so I had a bunch of these. Uh, of course, they arrived last minute, and uh, I was soldering them together at a hotel room with a hot air rework gun uh, to heat them up and put them on there. Um, I fried a few of them, but you know that, that's what happens when you solder things in your hotel room. In the end, I basically have this device, right? It's our RSA token. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you noticed before, there's a battery here. I tap into the battery itself, so I don't even have to add an extra power supply. And I've got my little Bluetooth mod module sitting here, connecting to all of these pins, listening to them. And I can listen to see what key, what six-digit pin is out at any time, and broadcast it over Bluetooth. So anybody in proximity can see it or hear it. Um, you know, another idea, if you like, are really like, lazy and you don't want to dig up your key, you can, you can actually reprogram this thing to appear as like a Bluetooth keyboard. So like, you go to like, log in, you just have this thing spitting out your Bluetooth you know, your over Bluetooth keyboard, you know, type in your pin for you. Uh, probably not the best idea. Probably undermines a lot of the security. But again, like, took a device it's supposed to have all these security principles, um, and we just kind of ignore those and go about a different way of approaching the data that we really want to get at. So the next example is Secure Boot. Um, whose laptop has Secure Boot? Right? How many of you have to have uh, Secure Boot so that it boots Windows and it does other things in your system? And when you boot Windows, you can check and see the Secure Boot status is on. Well, so in order to uh, make this happen, we have to be able to check a bunch of keys. Of course, we don't have any place to store keys except for the spy flash on our system in the BIOS, which is very trivially rewritable. So the easiest way, easiest way in is to go and change those keys manually. Um, but let's say we want to find another approach, another interesting approach to, to get out of this whole like, secure boot problem. Um, actually, let me just skip to this one. It's a little more clear what's going on. We basically have a series of keys that will only check the signature on your EFI executable. Right? The EFI executable is what goes ahead and then loads up your, um, loads your, kernel, uh, your kernel. And then your kernel runs and loads modules or drivers or whatever, you know, whatever your operating system may be. Um, so we have a key checking system. We have all the keys we need, all the certificates on the flash chip um, in the system. And what happens, though, if we want to have compatibility, right? So Microsoft had some issues trying to convince everyone they should only run Windows on their hardware. So in the, in the Secure Boot spec that Microsoft publishes, it says, you must be able to add your own keys. And also, we will sign keys for third parties. So one of the things they signed, Microsoft signed the boot shim for Ubuntu. So this shim is an FEX executable that goes, and it checks the signature on your bootloader, in this case Grub, which is signed by Ubuntu, and it compares the keys and says, OK, you're good. We can load Grub. Now we've got Grub running, and Grub is going to go ahead 
and whoops, uh, and load the Linux kernel, right? And it's going to check the signature on the kernel to make sure it's signed by Ubuntu. Your kernel then goes, checks all your modules before it loads on, so on and so forth. We've got this, this process figured out. Um, so here's a dilemma here, you know, an interesting caveat to this. If, if Grub can't find a signed image to boot, it's, a, it's no problem. We, we still want to run, so we'll, we'll exit boot services, we'll turn off the whole secure boot functionality, and we'll insecurely boot an operating system. Oops. Um, so yeah, there are some people with uh, uh, opinions about the security of this approach, uh, especially when we consider the fact that uh, the bootloader, Grub, is a pretty complicated thing, right? Um, this complicated piece of software um, will boot pretty much anything, right? It'll boot Windows. So we are start off in a, in a secure boot system. We boot the shim. We boot the bootloader. The bootloader can't find a signed kernel. It loads an unsigned one, which is great because we can backdoor that pretty easily. Um, Another interesting scenario is if we wanted to, we could look at the fact that Grub is a pretty complicated piece of software. There's three image parsers written from scratch, a whole lot of config files. You can actually add additional modules to Grub so you can add file system support and several other things. So maybe it's bug free. I wouldn't count on it. I haven't looked deeply to figure that out, but uh, it only, we're only one bug away from being able to exit your bootloader without closing out boot services and then going on and booting whatever you want with secure boot turned on in hardware. But anyway, uh, yeah, there could be a, a couple interesting features with that. Let's move on, though. So that really was kind of a cheat, right? When we're talking about hardware security, hardware security we had a hardware root of trust, which was a spy flash chip. Um, what about a trusted platform module? That makes things a whole lot better, right? If we have a trusted platform module, we can trust the platform. That's what the name says. So what does it do? It does crypto stuff. Don't need to worry about any more than that. It plugs into this header. It's an LPC header on your motherboard. Some laptops have them already installed, um, and some newer systems have them implemented in pseudo software by the manageability engine, I believe. And there's some great news about that coming out this week. Um, many systems don't ship with them um, because they cost money, and when you're selling motherboards to like gamers, they don't care about things like secure boot. So in human terms, though, uh, you need one of these to use BitLocker. So if for some reason, you know, you're a gamer, you built your own system, you bought all the commodes yourself, and suddenly you think, like, you know, the government's after you and they're spying on you to see, like, all your high scores and, and tamper and, you know, notice that you're cheating in your games. So you go and you buy, you need to buy a TPM. Where are you going to get one? Um, so in the U.S., there's Best Buy. They don't have them. Fry's, a nice place to get it, but they don't have them either. Micro Center, no. Radio Shack doesn't carry anything anymore. So if you want to hook up with a TPM, you need to find a sketchy dealer. Where do you find those? On eBay. So, I mean, part of the reason that this is the case is because they've secured the supply chain for these, right? So you're only supposed to get them when you, when you trust them. The problem is most people don't have access to the supply chain. So they find their sketchy dealers on eBay, and they're like, oh, well, I can get this one for $12.31. That'll save me $0.16 cents over that guy. So I'm, I'm really into saving, so I'll save my, my $0.16 cents to get it from somebody. So... Yeah, what is a sketchy thing you're plugging into the computer that you bought from someone you don't know for the lowest price possible? Um, basically, it plugs into the LPC bus, right? LPC is a version of uh, essentially the ISA bus, except it runs four times as fast with one quarter of the pins, right? What's really neat is LPC can do DMA by pulling down the LDRQ pin. Like, oh, this sounds really interesting. I'm a big fan of DMA attacks, if any of you know me. Um, wouldn't it be great if someone did all this work for me so I wouldn't have to go and design something that sits on the LPC bus myself? Oh, wait, someone has. Open open course, we have an implementation of an LPC host device that we can throw on, um, on a piece of on a uh, uh, FPGA to go and make a device. Of course, uh, I was foiled when I found out that here is the TPM header, and you might notice that the pin that's missing is LDRQ. I can't make a malicious TPM that also does DMA attacks against your system yet. Um, so I'd have to find that somewhere else. That was my first plan. I was thinking, okay, it couldn't be too hard. I'll start selling these on eBay for like $12.31 or $12.30, undercut the, the next seller and see how many people install these. Didn't work out so well. The point though is anybody can make a TPM, right? It's an open standard. You just have to read 200 pages plus 184 pages plus 339 pages to implement all of these things. So Obviously, there's a barrier to entry, but again, we have the situation where we trust pieces of hardware, right? Except we can, that piece of hardware is interchangeable. As long as we have a valid spec complying TPM, our system works. Um, what's, to tell, what's to stop us from implementing a TPM that has a, an intentional backdoor that leaks our keys? Um, how would it go about doing that? 
so onward. Um, people get them from sketchy sources, right? We could make a, a malicious one if we had the time. It doesn't uh, have DMA access with just the, the standard connector, but we could probably make a leaky one, one that would somehow leak out those keys. Excuse me. Uh, maybe the next time I have patients or a nation state backing me, I can go down that path. So we have the RSA token, the insecure boot, spliff, trusted platform, and now the YubiKey. Who uses a YubiKey? OK, I do too. Um, they're pretty cool. They're tiny. They work pretty well. Um, where'd you get your YubiKey? You, you buy it? Did you get it from Yuko? Did it come in a little plastic package with a little gold tab over it? Did you get it free at a conference? Um, so I, <coughs> I was at a conference, and there's someone giving out YubiKeys. So I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Can I have one? I don't have one yet. And I think about it, I'm like, hmm, here's a YubiKey. And like, can I take a bunch of these? And they said, oh, sure. So I took a handful, which fueled my research. Um, so I'm like, OK, so I got these YubiKeys. Are these legitimate YubiKeys? Because you know, I, I trust the vendor that was giving these out, but I don't necessarily trust the person who was manning the booth to have been like, you know, keeping their hawk eyes on these YubiKeys the entire time. I don't know where they were shipped or where they shipped from. And they were bulk packed. They weren't individually packaged. So a lot of questions here. So I go on Yubico's forums and look up for like questions about counterfeit or legitimate YubiKeys. And sure enough, there's, uh, this YubiKey looks way different. Is this a fake? And Tom, too, which is a representative, who is a representative of Yubico, says, do they have an imprint that says powered by Yubico? Um, do they have a serial number? Then they're probably OK. Mm, this is not the answer I want. I want a way to actually verify with some sort of confidence you know, that, that this is actually a real YubiKey. So there's actually another method. You can go and verify it with an, a one-time password. When you get a YubiKey, it comes with an AES key programmed by Yubico. And you get this, and you dump, uh, you plug it in, you go to their web page, you put your mouse over there, and you push the button, and you get a one-time password that spits out there. And sure enough, it'll tell you, um, oh, sorry, I don't have a picture of that. It'll tell you, you have verified your YubiKey. It is legitimate. Well, here's the thing. Some people don't trust YubiCo that much because they want to put their own AES keys on there. So they have a tool that lets you go ahead and do that. You can put your own AES key and program your, um, program your YubiKey with this new AES key. Um, but then you can't verify yourself with YubiCo anymore. So there's a solution to that. You can upload this key to YubiCo so they know to verify you with that new key. So, OK, we have this method of changing our key. Well, what else can we do? Um, they're really nice. They, they come up with this cool like uh, emulator. So we can program an Arduino to, to emulate a YubiKey. That sounds great. Um, I have a bunch of Arduinos lying around. So wouldn't it be neat if we could uh, verify one of these devices? And yep, congratulations. You have been successfully authenticated with YubiKey. Hmm. So there's a little bit more that goes into this. Um, as you can maybe see here, uh, I don't know if it's bright enough, but whatever. There's, there's the little Arduino right there, and this is the one sitting there that we've just authenticated with. Yes, so we can legitimize a fake YubiKey. This sounds pretty cool. Um, of course, if you're going to go to a conference and someone hands you one of these and says, yeah, here, free YubiKeys, uh, I don't think many of you will trust that, would you? So let's, let's, let's see what we can do. Uh, we, can, uh, we can take basically the same circuit on here and put it onto a PCB. Um, uh, we make some mistakes along the way because we put the, the Yubico uh, logo upside down and then backwards the next time. And then we forget to cover our tent, tent our vias, so it looks a little, little shoddy. Um, we have at the bottom here a little programming port so we can provision it with our key. Um, and then you know it still doesn't look just right, so we need a case to put it in. Um, the Yubikos have, Yubiki, the real YubiKeys have a much nicer case, but we, we hastily 3D printed one, which doesn't look too great, but it kind of gets the point across. Um, so it's, it's almost there. And if, if, if we're down to the point where the difference is like a, manufa a, a manufacturing process, like that's something that's kind of been solved by people who know what they're doing. We're not, we're not uh, materials people. We're, we're just hardware hackers um, or stunt hackers. I'm not sure which. Um, so we're pretty close. We've got something that looks a lot like a YubiKey with some minor differences. Um, let's go and get a quick video of how we can actually provision one of these. Um, so in order to do that, there's a little quirk in this system. I have to disconnect. And I'm saying it out loud because otherwise I forget. And then I need to close that tool, open this tool, and then reconnect. And I should have a video on the screen. Connection in progress. Obtaining IP address, preparing for disk. Oh, there we go. So here's our video. Let's. 
Uh, where are we starting from? So we're going to go, and we're going to go and personalize our YubiKey. So we have a, a legitimate YubiKey, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to, is it playing? Come on. Yeah, there we go. So we're going to go, and we're going to um, put a new key into this legitimate real YubiKey. Um, and we have to regenerate a new key. So we have a new public identity, private identity, and secret key. We're going to cut and paste those over into our header file for our Arduino uh, version of the thing, running the, uh, the YubiKey emulator uh, program. Copy our private identity over. So these are the things that the YubiKey needs in order to generate, um, generate those one-time passwords. And once we delete all our spaces, do, 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 do. If he used Vim, he wouldn't have to do this. Mike made this video. That's why it's so clean and prompt and correct. Mine would have been much messier. Um, so we've got that. Now what we want to do is we want to upload this key. So write the configuration to the key. Um, oh, sorry, to a file, just so we have a, a backup copy, because we don't want to lose this key. Um, upload this to Yubico. We say, here's our new key. Please take it. Um, oops. Doxed himself. Um, and we've got to paste our, oh, sorry, we've got to pu put in an OTP. So we've already programmed it to the real YubiKey. We get an OTP from the real YubiKey. Um, we pass, bypass this whole capture thing, and we upload this new key. OK, we did it. Keys upload successful. We can go and we can test it with the legitimate YubiKey. OK, it works. Congratulations. Now what we need to do is we need to go and take that same key and program it into our Doobie key, which is our dubious key. Um, Doobies for short. So we compile and we flash. And once we're done, we now have a fake Yubi key um, with a shared key with a real Yubi key. So there's a process here. The process, we actually have to burn a real Yubi key to make our fake Doobie key. And we can go and we can go back to the authentication and we drop. Come on. There we go. We spit out our thing and it says, Congratulations, you've been successfully successfully authenticated with YubiKey. Um so there, we did it with our with our with our Arduino. Um so what's the point of this? Like what can we do with this? Um Yubico was very kind and actually changed the text on that. So if, a, if you verify with a key that you have uploaded yourself, it gives a slightly different prompt to not give people the perception that they are actually validating the hardware. They're just validating the key. But what happens when we have this, this Doobie key and we go to a web page? And I don't know if you can see it, but uh, the mouse cursor over there below blink fast is jiggling around a bit. And if we look back at our evil admin, we realize that those jiggles on that mouse are actually uh, hid commands that are exfiltrating the keys that we just put on that Doobie key. So we can have a malicious website somewhere that goes and extracts the keys off of your, your, your Doobie key. So at some point in time, we'll see here, we got the public ID and a monotonic counter off of our Doobie key uh, just over JavaScript. So yay. So what just happened? Uh, let's get some slides back up. The demo worked because it's just a video. Um, so what happened? Basically, we have reprogrammed uh, the key. Where is the key? Somewhere in here. User AES key, right? And we have made it so that we have two separate devices that are going to verify the same way and validate those OTPs, right? Of course, one of our devices is a um, is a device that can, uh, yeah. Oops, there's a missing slide here. One of those devices is a programmable USB device that we can go and we can add other features to. So we chose to exfiltrate the key with mouse jiggles. Um, you could also give it some extra commands, you know, send it whatever, and it, it gives you the key back. That would require a little more hardware access. Um, we chose the, the JavaScript because you can conceivably do that remotely from your web server somewhere else. Um, so that's the Doobie key. Um, the last example I've got is this uh, stateless computer. And there was an excellent, uh, so we've had some examples. We see that there's little issues with how we use all these hardware security modules. So maybe we should rethink this whole hardware security thing from scratch, right? 
So there's an awesome, awesome uh, paper, State Consider Harmful, by Joanna Rakowska at Invisible Thing Labs. If you haven't read this, you should probably check it out. It was last year, or is it two years ago now? What year is it? 2017? So yeah, it's two years ago now. Um, and it's a pro proposal for a stateless laptop. The argument being, like, let's take all this state. We have our, our disks, we have our, our BIOSes, we have our firmwares. We don't want all these little bits and pieces of firmware in our target system because that means we need to keep a vigilant eye on it. We can't leave our laptop in our hotel room because someone might go open it up and reflash the BIOS and change keys or change uh, our bootloader. So what can we do if we isolate the state from the logic, right? We get our BIOS, our firmware, our EEPROMs, our NVRAM, all this storage type stuff, and we isolate it from the stuff that actually does the work, the processor, the communication, the I.O. devices, right? So we, we have this stateless PC, which is pure logic. Um, this is the stuff we need to trust. We need to trust the code we're running is our code. We need to keep a more careful eye on this code to make sure it doesn't get tampered with, modified, or, uh, or, or changed. So let's kind of simplify this to like the, 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 the most basic scenario we can come up with. And so we have states, which essentially are a bunch of bits structured in various ways. And then we have logic, which are gates. And these gates are just gates. They're not configured in latches. We just have combinational logic. So let's implement these in the simplest chips we've got. A SPI EEPROM is a pretty simple device. It has a bunch of flash on it, not much, a few, few K or a few megabytes. And then a quad XOR gate. This is a chip that was designed in the 60s and 70s and hasn't really changed much to this day. And you can still get them. So let's make a board. You know, I'm from Oregon, so I made a PCB the shape of Oregon. So that's the Noregon Nor EEPROM state board. Um, and as you can see, there's a spot here for me to plop down just an uh, a, a SPI EEPROM. Um, we get our commands in from the computer and we spit out some data that goes on to the logic board. Right, this is, this is essentially our key storage device. Now for the logic board, I needed something like that was uh, like logic oriented, so I've got the, the, the live long and prosper Vulcan thing because they're all logical, lo uh, logical uh, uh, species. Um, and you know, of course, if you follow alternate timelines, then they're also stateless, so this is doubly applicable. But here we've got a spot for a 14 pin uh, uh, quad input XOR gate. So basically all we're gonna do is we're gonna take our key and our data from our system, XOR them together. Uh, let me draw a proper XOR gate, XOR, and spit that out on the other side so that we have our encrypted, our ciphertext, okay? And this is great because it's just a quad XOR gate. We don't have to trust this thing. This is our computer. It just does the work. It's not going to do anything. Uh, it's not supposed to. I don't have a demo, so I should probably, maybe that's a not demo. That's what I meant. Dot, yeah, bang, bang, bang. Three, three inversions means I don't have a demo. Um, basically, the user sends plain text, right? I have it prototyped up here. The plain text goes and is XORed with uh, the contents of this flash chip by the, by the XOR gate, and it gets shifted back out to the PC. Okay, pretty cool. When you go off the end of the EEPROM, it just loops back around to the beginning, so it's you know like a one-time pad that gets used over and over again, which is not really a one-time pad, is it? Um, but the question for you, can you verify this board? Right? So let's take a look at this board. Uh, it looks good. It's got 14 pins on that chip. It's a really old chip. We read the, the markings. It says 74LS86, so it must be a quad input OR gate, right? Um, and if we test it, it follows the, the truth table properly. If we put a uh, 1 and a 1 in, we get a 0 out. If we put 0 and 0 in, we get 0 out. If we put 1 and 0 in, we get 1 out. Okay, it works. It must be an XOR gate. Um, the thing is, a 14-pin dip can be many, many, many things. Um, an ATtiny84 actually fits the bill really well. Um, so we do need to blue wire it a little bit because of uh, where the power and ground pins are on the ATtiny84, AT but that could definitely easily be concealed. So um, now we have to go and counterfeit uh, an XOR gate. Uh, so one of these things is not like the other. One of them has an ATtiny84, one has a 74SN86. Who could tell which is which? From this distance, probably neither of you. You might notice that there's a, the chip marking here and here, so pin one is different. But again, these are cosmetic things. Um, if we wanted to, we could just file that off, and we'll be, no one would be the wiser. Faking a crypto ASIC, that would be hard, right? Well, here's the Arduino code that does it. Basically, you enter a loop, and you read one pin, you read the other pin, you XOR then, and you spit that on your output pin. So the dilemma here, this is running a 16 megahertz processor, so it's kind of not going to be nearly as fast. Uh, as a, a real XOR gate, but 
yeah, this is a this is a two dollar microcontroller. This is a two dollar microcontroller with a kid friendly IDE. So this is like baby gloves on, and we can still manage to do this. So what happens if we add a little bit of state? So we add a timer in here, and basically every time the timer triggers, we're going to uh, read a bit from our key, and we're going to write it to our EEPROM. Right? So these devices have uh, 512 to 2 megabyte, megabits of EEPROM, depending on the model. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we sit there and read and constantly grab the bits of our key and store them in our local EEPROM. So basically, we now have this logical machine that's supposed to be stateless that's listening to our entire key and recording it so that we can use it later. So, I mean, this is, this is kind of false advertising, right? You're supposed to be stateless, right? You're not supposed to trust stuff, right? We trusted you to not have state. But here's the problem. Wasn't the whole point to not have to trust your logic to begin with, right? So basically, what it comes down to is uh, we have the things that we need to trust, and then we have the things we need to trust that we don't need to trust, and we really have not gotten anywhere in terms of advancing uh, our, our, our theory here. Um, so, so that is the altered state machine. Um, so basically, we have all these scenarios where one by one, we have hardware security modules. We have not necessarily hardware security modules, hardware security devices that we use to improve the security of our software. Um, and we use them because we think we can trust the immutable hardware a little bit more than the software. Um, however, if, if I and uh, Rikua in our free time can go and undermine all of these things, then imagine what a funded person would be able to do. So we poked about five devices. Every single one of them is an improvement to uh, a purely software security process, a purely, purely software crypto process. But again, they aren't magic. Um, hardware doesn't make things safer. And it doesn't necessarily make things harder. But what it does do is it raises the barrier to entry by a few dollars. Okay. We used to think that, like, oh, it's hardware. It's like really expensive to, to bypass that stuff. And maybe that was true a while ago, where it might take hundreds or thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to do some of these things. But we're at the point where anybody with $5 um, can do some of these things. And when you, when you really think about it, a few dollars, $5, is actually a, a, an infinite increase in the cost compared to a purely software attack where you can just download the software for free. Right? Again, there's all the overhead costs. Like, you have to have a computer and an internet connection but we'll assume that anybody can get access to those without too much effort. So they improve security and use them. Um, but the threat models that we're talking about are actually a lot more complicated than we give them credit for. We just go and we take these software threat models that we've been using as we secure our software, and we're kind of like mm, giving a couple extra scenarios, added, added bits to them. So again, we have this, this, the evil maid attack, which is the one that most people talk about, um, and a supply chain to attack that everybody kind of thinks is still theoretical, but then we start getting these bits of evidence of like, wow, we could actually make a silicon trojan. We could actually, you know, we actually saw a leaked picture of a, you know, box with a, uh, a switch being interdi interdicted and modified, perhaps. Um, so there's evidence that some of this is happening, but in all reality, like when we start going to the scenario where we buy our crypto modules from eBay and we get our, our, our uh, one-time password keys free at conferences, um, the supply chain really makes a bigger difference. Um, and lastly, the end user scenario is kind of one that's always been around and will continue to be around because, uh, I mean, I love game consoles. I get all kinds of games consoles. I go through, I modify them, and then I never play any games because that's not actually any fun for me. Um, we also have common vectors, the ways that people get in. Um, you know, external ports, we think like, oh, we have a hardware device and it's got a port, we can reprogram it, we're done. Like, that's kind of the, the, the basic attack. Uh, the, the realm where we go into counterfeit chips, we kind of try and think that counterfeit chips are a hard thing to do because you have to go manufacture chips. We have really capable microcontrollers today. Um, as I mentioned with that little Bluetooth module, right, that tiny little module has uh, more performance in it than, you know, most of the other chips that we've, we've uh, you know, discrete chips that we have from the, the 70s and 80s uh, and now. Um, and lastly, intrusive techniques. Uh, just because the one scenario you come up with involves decapping and uh, fibbing an existing chip and having it still work after the fact doesn't mean we can't just get a replacement chip and drop it in there, um, depending on how the hardware module where you're talking about is designed. So another thing that, uh, that Mike popped up uh, earlier this week and, and pointed out is dismissing hardware attacks in your threat model is a mistake. Your adversary has $5 and low skill. Right? So if you check out uh, SparkFawn, they have uh, a write-up of some uh, gas station uh, uh, 
uh, card skimmers. Basically, these little devices, right, which is um, you know five dollar board, and there's a lot of them. I think they indicated like the fact that this one says 46 on it means there's probably about 46 of them or more, right? There's so many of them they're numbered, and an unskilled attacker goes and somehow implants these in the gas pump, and then it goes and logs every single card, and then when you're ready to collect the data, you show up. Uh, the back of this device right here has a little Bluetooth module, right? See, Bluetooth module, everybody's doing it. Um, little Bluetooth module that broadcasts all the data that was found on this, uh, from this pump, that was collected by the skimmer on this pump. So, software hacking is looking at the layers of abstracting and find a way through. Um, we make a mistake in thinking that hardware is immutable. Hardware is just another layer of abstraction. Those of us who design hardware know that we actually have, like when we, talk about, when we hear people talk about full stack and all that stuff, well, hardware is really full stack with layers upon layers upon layers of abstractions that have been sitting there um, for decades at this point without ever really being revisited. Um, Again, software doesn't run hardware, it runs a layer of, of abstraction all the way down to electrons and atoms. Um, so, I, with closing, I would ask you, do you still trust your hardware implicitly? If so, what are you smoking? So, any questions? <laughs>